it's really uh, important that they achieve certain flight parameters so that the weapon can achieve the impact parameters that it needs. We're fortunate enough to have uh, a B-2 pilot, uh, Lieutenant General Mark Weatherington, with us here to give us some kind of insight. I mean, you have to think about the fact that these B-2s, you talk about these bunker buster bombs, the mobs, right? And nobody else has them except the United States. So to talk to somebody who's actually flown a B-2 is fascinating. When you're trying to punch that weapon, you know, 30,000 pound weapon, but 24,000 pounds of it is a special hardened alloy steel so that it can cut through that rock and get deep before the 6,000 pounds of high explosives detonate. And you're going to follow that with a second weapon, you know, going through that same path broken up to allow that second weapon to penetrate deeper and hopefully get into the mission space and detonate. Not only do you have to hit these different tunnels, right, that bore down to a certain depth, but there's also a mountainside that was uh, impacted as well. Hey, WX, thanks for uh, joining us again here on uh, Micro Journeys. It's uh, been a pretty uh, busy week for you as it relates to the Operation Midnight Hammer that was executed on Saturday. A lot of people are interested in your perspective, uh, given your previous roles with the B-2 and, uh, you know, the deputy commander role that you held and the such, I wanted to take a moment for the listeners to get a perspective that's uh, slightly different than uh, what a lot of people have been asking you about, which has been more on the operational side. As you know, we uh, do a lot of work in the uh, technical space. So I'd like to kind of get your perspective from a technical angle as it relates to, you know, not only that mission, uh, but overall, from a bomber perspective, how uh, technology helps to influence and impact, you know, successful execution uh, operations like the one we saw on Saturday. You bet, Dan. I'm, I'm happy to be back with the with the podcast. And absolutely, you're right. There's a huge technological aspect to this mission. And it's it starts with the platform, of course, you know, the B-2 being an incredibly unique warfighting platform with some interesting capabilities, you know, probably the best aerial navigation system that we have out there, the most precise, uh, you know, just a few tweaks that they made in the avionics to to make it that much more accurate in delivering those weapons. And certainly a, a similar thread flows through the, the GBU-57 MOP, you know, highly accurate and precise, uh, unlike any other weapon that we have. And and partially because of its size, you know, it's, it's really large. So winds and other environmental factors don't affect it as much but it also just has a very precise, very unique, highly accurate navigation system and, and sensors that are used to make sure it hits the exact spot that we want it to hit. For everything from actuators to, to microchips, to cards, to, to everything that goes into both those systems uh, relies on a lot of technology, a lot of the things that TSS deals with day to day. You know, one of the interesting aspects of, I'm going to call it a bunker buster that uh, was used uh, for this operation, was the ability to bore down into a bunch of rock and then successfully, you know, explode and the such. The, uh, you know, you couple that with all of the different technology aspects that you mentioned. One of the questions that I would have is, is from a pilot's perspective, how do you integrate, you know, your training with all of these technological solutions that are, you know, at your fingertips to execute a mission like this? Well, certainly the, the pilots are all trained to employ the weapons that they're carrying. And so uh, there's a, there's certifications involved depending on what the weapon is, depending on the seeker that it might use or its capabilities. And so all of these pilots were trained specifically to employ the GBU-57 in all the modes available to it to understand that technology, to understand how the weapon functions and, and how they have to release it. And it's really a, a important that they achieve certain flight parameters so that the weapon can achieve the impact parameters that it needs. And so that weapon will be controlled from the release to the impact uh, using the actuators and the different guidance systems and algorithms in there. And they're looking to achieve a certain impact velocity and a certain impact angle and a certain impact azimuth on a target so that the, it, the weapon will do what we think it's gonna do. And in this case, when you're trying to punch that weapon, you know, 30,000 pound weapon, but 24,000 pounds of it is a, is a special hardened alloy steel so that it can cut through that rock and get deep before the 6,000 pounds of high explosives detonate. And you're gonna follow that with a second weapon, you know, going through that same path 
the rock and, and all the what may be piled on top of that facility broken up to allow it to pen that second weapon to penetrate deeper and hopefully get into the mission space and detonate and destroy whatever might be in there. The feedback, you know, uh, that we're seeing as it relates to this this mission is that uh, not only do you have to hit these different tunnels, right, that bore down to a certain depth, but there's also a mountainside that was uh, impacted as well. So one of the questions that I have is, is you know, from a technological standpoint, uh, this is something that sets uh, apart the United States from, you know, a variety of other, you know, countries around the world, right? Would you say that this is a major differentiator and gives us, you know, uh, not only technological superiority, but an increased national security capability versus uh, some of the other countries like Iran and Israel? I think nobody else has this type of capability to go as deep, as accurately, uh, and impact a target complex. But this is a great example of of ingenuity, right? Uh, this was a specific problem where the United States had some intelligence, had some understanding, and had to characterize a very complex target set, and then purposefully design a weapon that could impact and, pr and provide the results that we hope it provided. And so it wasn't just that we built this weapon and, and uh, we're, we're lucky that it was on the shelf when this operation was conceived. This was purposely designed to go after this exact target. And that mission's been rehearsed and it's been refined as we understand more, as we get additional intelligence, as we refine it in our concepts and operating and, and practicing it multiple times. They changed the strike package. They changed the target uh, aim points. They may change uh, the tactics that are used to get the best results we can possibly get. You know, you talk about off the shelf uh, technology. Uh, it really uh, uh, kind of leans into something that the president has had, you know, his sights on. Uh, can you talk a little bit about, uh, you know, Iron Dome and how that's been a benefit to Israel? And now with, you know, these kinds of technical integration in supporting national security, how important that's going to be for the rollout of Golden Dome? Well, you bet. I mean, certainly Israel has a different strategic context than the United States. They have very limited strategic depth. They're surrounded by Although uh, it's a friendlier region than it was, they're certainly surrounded by some adversaries that have the ability to reach out and touch them with, with weapons at, at a medium range or, or longer ranges. And so their challenge was, how do we protect our citizens? How do we protect our nation, uh, which is a very, very narrow in some points? How do we, what, what can we do? And so they came up with this concept of Iron Dome which provides awareness and, and situational awareness on an attack that may be taking place, the ability to track incoming missiles in particular, because that's a, a huge threat, uh, and then to engage them with a, a variety of weapon systems to knock them out of the sky. And it's not 100%, but they do a remarkable job uh, in, in doing that. And so when the administration looked at this and, and said, Oh my gosh, look, we've had these aerial phenomenon, balloons coming over the over the continental United States. Uh, we've had some other unexpected things. We've got some drone uh, challenges out there, and, and we see that play out in Ukraine, but it also played out certainly in the United States, in New Jersey, and other places over the last year. I think there's a heightened awareness that there are new threats and new concerns that we need to address, and, and that's really what Golden Dome is about. It's going to look different than it looks in Israel because the United States has incredible strategic depth, geography, just the expanse of territory that's got to be covered. We won't be able to cover every piece of territory. So they'll have to prioritize. They'll have to come up with a, a list of what assets are we going to defend and how are we going to defend them. And then they're going to have to build a much larger capability that integrates space sensors, ground-based sensors, radars. Uh, infrared detectors and all of those things to provide awareness, and then a range of, of capabilities to shoot those incoming missiles or drones or other threats out of the sky in, in a safe and effective manner. Yeah, we're absolutely in a uh, unique position right now with all of these uh, conflicts continuing to evolve, uh, Israel and Iran being the most recent one uh, that that happened on uh, on June 21st, and looking back at how the United States can protect itself uh, uh, against any other you know kind of threats, known and unknown, is going to be not only a strategic challenge, but it's going to be a technological challenge going forward. As you said, it's not going to be the same type of approach, but it is an extreme need that the United States has given 
you know, a lot of the tensions that are happening around the world. So WX, I really appreciate the time here for this, uh, you know, quick interview on what's transpired here recently. Uh, I'm sure that we'll be talking quite a bit as uh, things evolve. So uh, thanks for your time and your expertise in this area. Thanks, Dan. Looking forward to the next one. 